있고요. Sarah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's a great pleasure. I have watched the uh, gestation of this Masters over a couple of years, and I'm really happy to see that the infant is up and walking uh, after one year. So that's fantastic. And I've met some of the very first students last year uh, who are now grown up big adults out, <laughs> in, the, out in the real world making uh, millions as uh, communicators of science and innovation. Uh, so that's the success of this uh, master's. It can turn out people with those capacities. So uh, I was, it, if you don't follow me, please raise a hand and say stop, because stop works in English and Italian. Okay? Uh, and we can go back if you like. I hope we have enough time to, to do that. Um, but I will try to remember to speak reasonably slowly, or reasonably clearly. Um, I'll also try to remember not to move around too much because Alberto has the camera on this point here, uh, and I do tend to walk. So I was asked to speak about images of science in the public sphere, and we've turned this eventually in conversation between us into images of science in the social conversation on science. Uh, and it's part of this series, as you know, uh, about images uh, in science seen from various perspectives. And uh, if you'll excuse my Italian, uh, I suggest that we can see images in senso stretto and images in senso lato. Uh, and I think some of the talks that you will hear later will be much more in senso stretto, so they'll be looking actually at visual communication. Uh, I'm not tonight. I'm looking at mental images, perceptions, uh, notions, uh, projections, etc., and associations that people make with science in talking about science in formal and informal ways. You might consider, if you're looking where are images situated in social life, you might consider that it's more logical to speak about images being part of imagination. They are, after all, from the same root. Uh, but, and some people do speak, including in our domain of social studies of science, do speak about public imagination and even and I think this is an offence to the English language, public imaginations, and even public imaginaries. Uh, we love in this, these disciplines to create new words. The old ones are never good enough, so we have to create new words. Anyway, uh, why have I decided, uh, and why indeed have did we decide that it makes sense to situate images differently in the social life, and that is because they are externalized and they are exchanged. And if they're simply in the imagination, there's no sense of them being exchanged. Hence, conversation. Um, I'll speak a bit more about the idea of the movement of images around uh, uh, social networks, not, not, I mean, in the sense that Christina was talking about social networks, I mean real social networks, not virtual ones, uh, but also um, how uh, they get translated and modified in the, in, in the exchange. Um, I'll be speaking to these current master's students tomorrow a bit more about this idea of the social conversation on science. Uh, so hold the thought and hold your questions, okay, if you don't mind, but uh, I've tried social conversation on science, the social conversation about science, the social conversation around science, the social conversation with regard to science, uh, all as possible um, ways of, of expressing this. However, there's all sorts of questions you could ask, and one of the questions you would certainly ask me is, well, all conversation is social. Unless you talk to yourself. And actually, that's okay too. 
Uh, in fact, it's a really good way to clarify your ideas is to have a conversation with yourself before you then have a conversation with somebody else. However, uh, I suppose what we're talking about is society's conversations with regard to science. Not just on science as, a piece, as pieces of information, but that relate to science. So hence my confusion, and now your confusion, uh, about what are the quite appropriate terms to use. But let's just step back from conversation for a moment. Close your eyes and paint a picture in your mind of a scientist. Okay? Nobody's doing it. Yes, you are. Close your eyes. Paint a picture in your mind of a scientist. Okay? What do they look like? Okay? You've got an image? So do they look like that person? So, honestly, honestly, how many people had a woman in their minds? That is truly shocking. That is truly shocking. I did not expect that. This is a scientific experiment of <laughs> deep significance. Um, did you have something like that in your mind? Yes, you did. Yeah, the caricature, but also the iconic portrait of the scientist. Did you have something like that in your mind? Do you recognize this scientist? That's Dr. Frankenstein. And as Massimiano and his colleague who are writing about images in na of science remind us, because you have to be reminded all the time, Frankenstein was not the monster, Frankenstein was the scientist, well, the doctor, okay? Maybe you had something like that in your mind? Or, hands up, who had something like this in their mind? Yeah, a team work, and very carefully constructed teamwork, multi-ethnic, <laughs> and at least two genders represented. Uh, but you, you see the point I'm kind of getting at, we have stereotypes, and those are images uh, of science and scientists. Uh, and we have also then social research methods, and Christina was touching on this just a moment ago, for trying to access the images that people have in their minds of science and scientists. And a colleague of mine, uh, Yvonne Cunningham, as part of her PhD in Dublin, organized a number of focus group conversations. Are you familiar with the concept of focus group? It's a kind of constructed conversation where you bring together 10 or 12 people, maybe 10 or 8 people, uh, with, who don't know each other, but who share something to talk about some topic or other and the purpose of the exercise is to see what happens when you throw in some stimuli, some ideas, some suggestions, what happens in the conversation. And so Yvonne was asking people, what do you associate in your mind with science? Uh, and so this takes us to a different kind of notion of the image from the one we just did a moment ago, but you'll see that one thing that came out strongly from the conversation within uh, a couple of these small groups was the distinction between the ordinary person, referred to as ordinary Joe, so or Giuseppe Ordinario, uh, ordinary Joe, and the extraordinary scientist. And that's not so, so surprising, but it's an interesting way uh, of accessing those images that people have is using that technique of focus groups. And it also draws attention to something that will come up again uh, in a moment, uh, this idea of the ordinary and the extraordinary, of the exceptional character of science and of scientists. Interestingly, you will see, and this then speaks to the question of the circulation of images, that the group talking about science and what they associated with science drew on images from science fiction. And so images of science and science fiction get, I won't say confused, but they get mixed in the social conversation uh, about science. And while some people might regard that as a really shocking thing, 
actually talked to many scientists and asked them where they got their first ideas about science from, and many will tell you it was from science fiction. Even though, as professional scientists, they must regard much of science fiction as a serious misrepresentation and distortion uh, of, of, of science and of its possibilities. Okay, so we've got some ideas about uh, different, different ways of looking at images in the social conversation. So what image does science have of itself? And I suggest that a version of the image that science has of itself is found in one of the classic pieces of sociology, one of the most enduring pieces of sociology ever done. And it happens to be in the sociology of science, written 77 years ago, or published 77 years ago originally, during World War II. And where Robert Merton, about whom Massimiliano knows volumes more than I do, Robert Merton distilled from observation of scientists at work and scientists talking among themselves and so on, that they were guided by what he called norms. Uh, but what this adds up to is then an image of the scientist. I would suggest to you that it's a benign image and it's even an idealized image that they regard the knowledge that they produce as available and owned by everyone, hence communism, because of the connotations of communism, that word is sometimes rewritten as communalism uh, or communality. Um, it was an interesting choice of word in 1942 in the United States of America, but anyway, communism. Universalism meaning that all the knowledge is, uh, is valid everywhere. Disinterestedness, it's a complicated word, meaning that the scientist engages in science without a particular interest in proving a particular thing that's of benefit to them. Okay? Uh, when you say that somebody is not interested in something, you say they're uninterested, but disinterested means that they're at a distance from the object. Maybe it works in Italian also, does it? Yeah. It's interesting. It does, okay. And then organized skepticism. So the skepticism of science, according to this view, is not just, oh, I don't believe that, and I don't believe that, and I don't believe that, which would be disorganized skepticism, but rather it's organized in order to test the validity of anything that is proposed uh, to be true or factual. So that is, gives you a, a notion of an image of science clearly as a public good, of science as a benefit to society unconditionally, yeah. assuming that it operates to those norms. And here are two scientists, uh, well actually three, but the two I want to refer to, who maybe meet those criteria rather convincingly. Bottom left is a man called Ernest Walton, and he's seen in 1932 in Cambridge with another Ernest, Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford from New Zealand won the Nobel Prize in 1908. In 1932, Ernest Walton from Dublin split the atom. That's the way we say it in the vernacular, <laughs> yeah, nuclear fission. He split the atom along with his colleague John Cockcroft. And uh, 20 years later, 19 years later, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. <coughs> the story is told that on a Saturday in October or November of 1951, a friend of Ernest Walton came to dinner at his house, as he frequently did, in the south part of Dublin, and came into the house and said to Ernest, what are these flashbulbs doing here? Now, most of you are too young to know what a flashbulb is. So when press men came to take pictures with a camera in 1950s, they came with a camera about, no, a camera about this size, with a big thing at the top of it, which contained a bulb. When you opened the shutter, the bulb lit up, just like 
Christine is going to do now in a second with a flash from her phone. But it then meant you had to take that bulb out, put another bulb in. I bet you don't believe me. Okay? <laughs> this is true. Okay. So there were these used flash bulbs on the table in the entrance to Ernest Walton's house and his friend said, what are they doing there? Oh, and he said, oh, I forgot to tell you. The press were here today taking pictures. I've just won the Nobel Prize. And I, the story, I think, is a lovely story because Ernest Walton was a very humble man. And actually, it may be not entirely irrelevant that he was a man of Methodist background, from a low church. Uh, in fact, his father was a minister of the Methodist church. And so humble a man was he, uh, or so modest a man was he, that having won the Nobel Prize, he did almost no more research for the rest of his life. He taught students, because he loved teaching students. My brother was lucky enough to be taught by him in the 1960s. Anyway, that's Ernest Walton. And this other man is William Campbell, top left and top right. And William, William Campbell is from another part of Ireland, and he won the Nobel Prize in 2015, uh, for physiology it's called, uh, and he had done practically all of his work after he left university where he would have possibly known Ernest Walton in Dublin. He spent his working life in the United States and he developed with a colleague drugs for the treatment of parasites that are common in tropical countries, including a parasite that causes river blindness. And you may know that millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people are affected or at some time in their life uh, by river blindness. And the drugs were called ivermectins. And William Campbell persuaded the company that had commercialized the drug to give it free to less developed countries. An indication of a benign science, a science conforming to those norms that we have just seen, uh, and you'll see even here, you can't, I know you can't read this in detail, but a lot of this indicates further a kind of modesty and humility which characterizes scientists as perceived in that kind of, ideal, uh, presented in that kind of idealized image. Actually, if you are getting to the visual images, I love this one on the top left, you know, he has two shelves of microscopes. Yeah, he's a biologist. And those are the kinds of microscopes he would have used as a student. And in fact, this piece of paper he has in his hand, uh, it, or it's not, it's a piece of cloth, is the cloth that he has as a, had a student to keep anatomical samples in that he was going to dissect in the laboratory. So that piece of cloth probably contained a frog at one time. Uh, anyway, and, and in fact, you would find him saying things that he, he feels almost like he's an imposter getting Nobel Prize for this work, and so on. So, the benign image of science. And there is possibly, and there has been offered, a contrary view. And uh, again, Massimiano will be very familiar with all of this, but Mitroff looked at the life and uh, community of space scientists uh, later than Merton did his work, and suggested that he could come up with a, a counter norm for every one of Merton's norms. Yeah? So where there was skepticism in Merton's view, there was dogmatism, organized dogmatism. Where there was disinterestedness, there was also interestedness. Where there was universalism, there was also particularism. And then more and more science is done with a focus on the smallest and of details in the most confined of circumstances. And I think you could probably say that Mitroff's view has been confirmed more strongly in some respects than, than uh, Merton's view in terms of how science is actually done. So, another set of potential images or another combined image of, of science at the general level. Moving on then more to scientists and how scientists are represented. 
Uh, I apologise to those who heard me last year here in the other sala, but I did use this image because I like it so much. Uh, it's from a student newspaper in the same college that I've just been referring to in Dublin, referring to this woman as a superhero leading Trinity's science charge. You two remember this one. Uh, and it, what, what's striking to me about this is the use of the term superhero from Marvel comics and that kind of thing, but also leading the charge. So we have a militaristic idea, yeah, fighting something. And it, you know, if Trinity had a superhero, this might be Professor Lydia Lynch. And it goes on to talk about it being remarkable, uh, prestigious. Etc. Etc. It's hard to keep, know how she keeps it all together. The, the report is full of hyperbole about this hero scientist. Um, she's a very interesting uh, and very talented and highly competent scientist. It must be said. She also features in another visual representation, which I think is very striking, uh, and it's this uh, portrait of women scientists that hangs on the wall of the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. Uh, and so our superhero, Lydia Lynch, is the fourth person from the left. And you see that each of them has been given some object in the image that corresponds with their work. But note, they're not in lab coats. They're not in a lab setting. They're not in a book, a, 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 an office with books and so on. And of course, there has to be somebody with the double helix. <laughs> and she's a professor of genetics. Possibly the most prevalent image of a scientific object, which is itself a constructed image. Yeah. Uh, I don't think your chromosomes actually look like that, uh, but it is a constructed image and it's become uh, one of the iconic representations of science in the 20th and 21st century. Um, I used this uh, also last year and uh, it fits, however, well with the idea of the superhero. So here's some person, here's a representation of a leading scientist who happens to be Italian and who is the Director General of CERN, the European Organization for Particle Physics. Uh, nuclear physics, actually, uh, but they don't like using the word nuclear. Uh, and she has apparently the key to the secrets of the universe. She has mystical, magical powers. Uh, but you reckon, you know, it's when you stop to unscramble these words that you actually realize there's some very interesting things going on there in constructing the scientist for consumption for perception, for reception uh, in society. The Pew Research Centre is a source of numerous surveys, uh, well they conduct numerous surveys and it's a source of prolific uh, amounts of survey findings about various things in society but including attitudes to science and you'll see here that last month, well, August of this year, they reported on a survey uh, which uh, was asking US population, or a sample of the US population, what terms they associate with scientists. And you'll see what the headline is, most Americans have positive image of research scientists, but fewer see them as good communicators. So 89% associated intelligent with scientists. 75% so so uh, associated the focus on solving real-world problems. 72% so, uh, associated scientists with the skill of working in teams. 71% associated them with honesty. 54% associated them with the notion of being good communicators. And then a line is drawn to represent 50%, but actually all of the good things are above the line and all of the supposedly bad things are below the line. You could, I think, legitimately, as a communications professional, as a journalist, make a headline out of this which says, 
nearly half of Americans think that scientists feel themselves superior to others. <laughs> but that's not the headline that they have presented. The headline they have presented is that, generally speaking, the population has a benign view of scientists, and that this is confirmed. Uh, well, it's confirmed by giving people suggestions as to what they might answer in the first instance. Not just suggestions, actually it gives them a limited choice of words and terms uh, that they might uh, uh, indicate their agreement with. But anyway, you get the idea that this then is added together to represent a positive image. I think that that uh, would merit some further consideration. Now, uh, going back to the idea of heroes, uh, this man was a stupendously prominent hero, not only in his own country, but internationally, in the years 2004, 2005, I think, just about into 2006. And you see, in fact, that he's standing in front of a poster that declares him pride of Korea. Who remembers Hwang Woo Suk? And you probably remember him having fallen from the status of hero to the status of villain, of anti-hero. Because it turned out that his science was fraudulent and that his financial behavior was also fraudulent. And he's arrested, he's dismissed from his position in the university, uh, and he's completely marginalized. The papers that were published in the big journals in his name were withdrawn. Uh, and so on. So the hero can also become the villain. This is a slightly different case of something similar. Uh, I, I, by the way, I wonder, I wonder which is likely to be the more lasting image. <laughs> it's pretty clear that most of the more lasting image will be this one, the disgrace. I think it's a great image because it has him in his lab coat still as he's taken away by the police. But anyway, uh, in relation to the next person, I'm not sure that they, uh, if you like, the later historical image will be the dominant one. Because this refers to James Watson. And this is a classically well-known well image of James Watson on the, is he on the left, with his friend Crick and his colleague Crick. And here they have begun to figure out the construction of DNA in the 1950s. And they published their famous paper, which is only one page long, isn't that right? Less than one page. Less than one page long. It fits onto one page, uh, where, in which they offered the proposition that the structure of DNA was like that. Uh, and uh, I mean, I won't try and explain because I couldn't explain what exactly they're, they're showing uh, with that. Now, there's all sorts of controversies that were contemporaneous about who had, was responsible for the finding, who deserved the credit for the finding, who should have got the Nobel Prize because there were two other people involved along with them, and one of them, of course, was a woman who got marginalized. Uh, but anyway, uh, Watson goes on to become a big public uh, figure uh, and their achievements are celebrated to this day. For example, just uh, in the last month or so in the Irish Times, a biochemist who writes a column there celebrating seven wonders of biological research and one of the seven wonders of biological research uh, is the construction of the DNA uh, structure by uh, Crick and Watson. Today, James Watson has lost most of his positions, uh, academic positions. Uh, he's regarded as a, well, he is regarded by some institutions as a persona non grata. Uh, he has spoken frequently and had been doing this for a long time before his the red card was shown or even a yellow card was shown 
He's speaking, spoken often about the superiority of certain peoples to over other peoples, defined by race and defined by other uh, uh, criteria. Uh, he, I've heard him speak, uh, and he, I've heard him say, if we don't play God as scientists, then who will? Uh, so that's his answer to the charge that scientists are playing God. No, is that, yeah, we, we, we should be. We're the best first people to do that. I've also seen him give talks where he says to young scientists, if you want to succeed in science, just find somebody great and stay with them, i.e. people like himself. And he is a hopelessly arrogant uh, uh, person. Uh, the tarnish has not worn, uh, the, the, the shine of his Nobel Prize is not yet worn. Yeah, nobody's suggested that he should have the Nobel Prize withdrawn from him. It's not possible. Because it's not possible. Uh, but there are other people who might deserve to have it happen. Uh, Watson maybe also. But he, he had extraordinary authority and position of privilege as a Nobel Prize winner. And you could say at the very least that he abused that position of privilege and that position of power. So we have seen heroes and villains. We've seen heroes who've got feet of clay. Uh, we've seen uh, notions of scientists as good team workers, humble, as brilliant, as dedicated, and maybe eccentric sometimes, and maybe Watson's pronouncements in the earlier phase just seemed a little bit eccentric, and then they became something worse than that. Uh, we've seen scientists as sort of saintly, uh, and I've taken that term from something that uh, Massimiliano wrote uh, about the public image of science in relation to Nobel uh, Prizes. But equally, we see images of scientists as competitive, as arrogant, as villainous, as careless, as dull, uh, as awkward, and, and so on. So we have a range, a spectrum, if you like, of different kinds of images. Uh, we have a population of scientists who are distributed across this spectrum and who indeed move across this spectrum uh, of, of uh, different uh, types. Moving on, I'm sorry, I actually need a tissue at this moment. Sorry, excuse me. Thanks very much. Uh, moving on, uh, I don't know if you've if seen these images uh, or images like them much, but the notion of belief in science uh, has become very strong and very current. Uh, I don't know if it's common in Italy. The hashtag believe in science actually is one that's used in Ireland. Uh, and I believe in science is actually an American t-shirt. And it certainly, uh, it creates a friction, I think, probably with what most of you think science, science's authority and science's credibility is based on. Not on faith, not on belief, but on an analysis uh, on our, um, and on evidence. Um, similarly, and in the same time frame, we have this idea that it's necessary to stand up for science. And yesterday, in fact, I was with somebody uh, uh, who uh, works with the organization um, Sense About Science in Britain, uh, and who runs workshops training young career, early career researchers to stand up for science. So why do we need to stand up for science? Because apparently, well, not just apparently, clearly in some situations, and, and no, most noticeably around climate science, science is under attack from certain quarters. Uh, and hence the, the famous March for Science uh, of last year, uh, which had, wasn't repeated because the children took to the streets instead. And the children took to the streets saying, believe in, well, they didn't quite say believe in science, actually. Uh, they were much more careful. They said, listen, listen to the science, which is an interestingly different uh, uh, perspective on it. 
Now, uh, I, I'll tell you something you didn't know and didn't need to know, but I was brought up a Protestant, and we used to sing a hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And I think that there's a, something very interesting going on here in, with this imagery, these t-shirts, these slogans, uh, these banners, uh, which refer to belief, refer to standing up and marching for and listening to the scientists and unite behind the science, although I think there is a slightly different uh, uh, connotation there. Uh, and I'm just going to pause the thought just to refer to this image on the right, because I was looking for images of the children's, young people's marches uh, and with, with science banners. And I found this one on a Middle Eastern website from Tokyo. And some people here will know that the child is wearing an Irish rugby shirt. <laughs> so there's a young child who went to the World Cup, or who possibly is of mixed Japanese and Irish parentage. Could be, could be, could be. Anyway, he's cheering for Ireland in the World Cup, and they need a lot of cheering. Uh, they're in trouble at the moment. And he's standing with a banner saying, unite behind the science. I love all the things that are going on here. And of course, it's very hard not to love and admire and respect Greta Thunberg, saying, listen to the scientists. Um, I've, I've just given you a hint of something that I, uh, I've started about the relationship, about, about the connotations of referring to science in terms of belief and standing up and so on. And this next set of uh, images relates uh, to a third part of that, which is the hope in science. Uh, and you'll see here uh, a story from the Daily Mirror in 2011 saying that there's an Alzheimer's test coming which gives hope to people, okay? Uh, now, I've followed this story to see, well, what's happened to the hope? And here's a story from a couple of years later saying a, a, a nanoscope will help early detection of Alzheimer's, and then another couple of years later, a test to predict Alzheimer's developed. And do you see where this is going? It's always about something that's coming, yeah? And here's something that said, says there's a holy grail blood test. Now, you know the holy grail is extremely hard to find. That's the point about the holy grail. In fact, you don't find it, as far as I remember from the story. However, there's a holy grail blood test which could help patients, and that was, I think, about two years ago. Here's one from early 2018 saying that a blood test for Alzheimer's shows early promise. We've now gone seven years and we're still hoping. And here's one from just last, uh, all, from August of this year, and we're getting closer. But you see the point what happens here, that, but what I'm drawing attention to is the hope in science, the image of science as delivering hope, as a source of hope. Now those of you who remember your St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we remember that he spoke about faith, hope, and love. And these three strong characteristics, or these three strong, uh, how should I refer to them uh, collectively, uh, anyway, these three strong terms are attached to religious faith, and they have become attached in recent, quite recent times, in a secular age, apparently, uh, to science. So uh, I think that that's an interesting thing to uh, uh, not just to reflect on and to wonder about, but also to observe as it, as it develops, where science becomes something that is to be deferred to where scientists become a kind of lay uh, priesthood uh, because they are closer to God, because they can decode the language of God. Do you remember this, what the language of God was? It was what the Human Genome Project was supposed to have revealed in 2000 and 2001. Uh, and here's a, a, a journal 
an, uh, an article in a journal for molecular biologists uh, warning about the use of such metaphors uh, and, and this, the possible danger. But the notion of searching for the Holy Grail, this, the, the creation of a mystique and so on uh, around science. In fact, uh, the creation of the, the uh, association of science and religion, uh, science as a religion. This was in a bookshop in Dublin a couple of years ago where the popular science books were on a table and somebody in the staff thought it was a good idea to put a little notice beside them saying, science, exclamation mark, the new religion. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it? When we, I passed via Galileo Galilei, and ever since then, we thought that science and religion would, have, would never be bedfellows. You know, we'd never be able to compromise. Uh, and, and now, here we have suggestions. Imagery that, that, that building up a, a, a composite picture of science as somehow equivalent to uh, religion. Now, I probably should speed up through the last bits of this. Uh, I want to play you a piece of music anyway. Uh, I want to just show you some examples of the way in which images from science are, have infused, uh, and Master Miano are just talking today about the notion of infusion is potentially a useful one, have, images from science have infused wider parts of culture, including, for example, visual culture. These images come from an exhibition of art by Irish artists uh, related to science. Uh, and you can see the double helix, of course, comes back. You can see here an image based on how clouds are form and, and reform and deform. And this actually is a moving plate on top of another moving plate, which simulates the, the formation of clouds. And that image up there is a million pencil strokes corresponding to billions of neurons in the brain. Uh, I, I can't imagine how the artist, a woman, managed to keep her brain in good order by doing this. But it is actually, it's quite a large piece. I suppose it's about, about a metre by 70 centimetres. Uh, and it's just lots and lots of little pencil marks representing, as it were, the confusion and the complexity of the brain. But these are not examples of scientific information being transferred, which is what science communication traditionally has been about. They are about representations of our world as understood by science, as translated by science, as uh, represented by science in translated further into the terms of visual arts. Uh, science becomes a subject of parody, of satire, in the, in the music of Tom Lehrer, who's written songs about relativity and about the periodic table. Uh, do some of you know Tom Lehrer? Do you, do you, if, you, if you don't know the song about the elements, you should learn it. And it goes through the periodic table as it existed at the time, in the 1960s, and it ends off with the wonderful phrase saying that these are all the elements, you know. Anyway, he, may, he manages to make discovered rhyme with Harvard uh, by saying that these are the elements as we have known them, at least as they have found them in Harvard. Uh, this is a comedian, an English comedian called Amanda Harkness, who became fascinated by the idea of big data and who gives these comedy talks about big data. Who would have thought it possible? Uh, so scientific ideas, scientific information, scientific themes get circulated in, in society, in culture, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, this uh, film was made by this person who did a degree in physics in Dublin, became a filmmaker, and decided then to do a documentary about the early, about the kind of pioneers of space science uh, who worked on uh, the Voyager program. And uh, it's a very, very moving, uh, affecting uh, documentary. And it affected uh, this person, who is a singer. 
She sings in a style that draws on traditional Irish singing, where traditional Irish singing sounds quite like something that they do in Sardinia. Now you might just get a flavour of that uh, here if I can call the music up. And what I find interesting, and I hope you find also interesting, is the way somebody's interest in physics becomes a film about people who worked in space science, which becomes an award-winning film about space science, which somebody sees and then turns into this. Did you recognize it, the, the words? No, they were in Irish, the Gaelic language. And she is a, a, a singer in the traditional Irish style, which is called Shan Nos, which is an Irish word. And she's singing about the view of the world, on Raiach is Shia, which is from the furthest view. And the film is called The Farthest, the Pew Lontano. Okay? Uh, and, and maybe that's just the idea. Maybe that's the the whole bit of science, in the sense. It's not about the mechanics of science, it's just about the perspective it gives us. And many people have, you know, lo remember, you know, about these people who travel in space talking about the Earth as a blue dot. Uh, and that image has percolated right through society, through popular culture. And so what I think we get here is an interesting example of how the conversations with society, within society, not directly necessarily between Ema Reynolds, the filmmaker, or Ethna Nikahasi, the singer, they probably don't know each other, but the kind of remote conversations, you know, lead to a, uh, an infusion, a percolation of ideas through uh, society, through popular culture. And the ideas perhaps are losing progressively as they spread, they're losing their definition. It might be claimed, or they're taking on new definition. Um, now, I have other examples also with music, and I'm just going to leave this one without music, although the music for this is wonderfully different from what you've just heard. Uh, but later on, by, if there are any requests for music, I might be able to play this one. But I, this is another example of the circuit I'm talking about, the exchange of images. So, Katie Mack is an astrophysicist who has written a book which will appear later next year called The End of Everything. So you better get your copy quickly, because after that there's nothing to, <laughs> to do. But what she, and many more have said this before her, say, is that if the universe has been expanding, as it has been over 
billennia, well, equally, the universe could contract. Stephen Hawking used to say this, uh, and he once told a story when I heard him speaking in, in uh, Dublin. He said, and, and I won't try and represent his voice because that would be extremely unfair, but he said, I remarked on this at a talk in Japan recently, and prices fell on the Japanese stock exchange immediately <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so he said, what goes up must come down, what goes out must come in, what goes expands must shrink. So anyway, that's what Katie Mack talks about, and the possibility of the end of the universe. And as she, as a scientist, is talking about it, she's using a poem by Robert Frost, the American poet, who says that the earth might end, the world might end in fire, or it might end in ice. I prefer fire. Or does he say, uh, anyway, he chooses between fire and ice. Uh, and she has her lectures on YouTube, and Hosier, Irish musician who's won Emmy Awards and all sorts of other awards, uh, is listening, is working away writing songs, and he's also half listening to these lectures. Uh, and he writes a song called, There's No Plan. In other words, the world is not conforming to somebody's design. There's no plan. There's no hand on the rain, that the rain is what holds the horse. Yeah? As Mac explained, there will be darkness again. Now, how many astrophysicists are name-checked in a popular song? Yeah? But it's better than that, because the Wikipedia entry on Katie Mack name checks Hosier as having referred to her. So you couldn't make this up uh, as an example of how the ideas and the images circulate and are exchanged and transformed. And the song is a really powerful uh, song. Uh, there's another twist to the story, because Katie Mack, who uses Robert Frost poems to illustrate her lectures, has now written poetry herself, uh, one called Disorientation. I want you to believe in the universe. It's actually a lovely uh, line, but I haven't got time to spend, uh, to spend on it. Uh, this is another Irish musician, Conor O'Brien. He's uh, part of the, the, he is the Villagers. And he stood up on stage in a, 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 in a park in Dublin in July when I was listening to him and said, the next song is about Ada Lovelace, a mathematician and scientist from the 19th century. <laughs> and then he sang and Ada Lovelace was the daughter of Lord Byron, the English poet. And she was regarded as one of the very, very earlier, earliest uh, programmers. She worked with Charles Babbage on the first machine, which was a kind of prototype computer. Uh, and his song doesn't refer to computer science or programming or mathematics. It refers to her as some kind of fantastical, uh, fatal, uh, fatally beautiful person. Put it that way. But I mean, again, how many times do singers stand up? He's a very popular singer, got a huge international following. How many times do singers stand up on stage saying, I'm going to sing a song about a 19th century mathematician? Yeah. So, I, again, I think it, uh, the fact that I could find three examples from Irish popular music performers suggest there's an awful lot more out there. Yeah? I suppose that's really what I'm trying to point to. Uh, I can't deal with that, uh, but here we, I think, have seen examples of science as a source of inspiration and of wonder, also humour, and the example I was going to give too would have given us a sense of, uh, of an image of science as providing comfort and protection. But the last image uh, I want to leave, uh, I want to uh, put up there, it relates to the idea of there being a street called Via Galileo Galilei. All over the world there are iconic, there are, there's iconography of this type. Plaques and street names that commemorate scientists, yeah? And what they do, this, this one is in County Wexford, near where I live, uh, equally this middle one, and that one is in Canterbury, uh, Christchurch in, in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and you'll know something about them all. They're all dead men. <laughs> and so there's now a huge iconography of science that is of dead men. I'm glad to have introduced you to some living women uh, earlier on as a counterpoint to the dead men that populate 
the popular imagination, perhaps, uh, of what science is. I think I'll leave it at that point. I'll leave you with dead men. Yeah.